All right, Clark Lee joins us now. As you know him, head football coach at Vanderbilt. Clark, welcome to the show, and, and thanks for doing this. Good to be back with you guys, always. Let me start us here. You had a long and interesting offseason. The addition of Jerry Kill, staff changes, all the stuff that, that's come with the restructuring or whatever the best term is here. When did you kind of realize that things needed to be done differently? What's that process been like ever since? Well, you know, you're you're in a kind of a constant mode of evaluation, um, you know, and that's day in and day out. Sometimes it's hard to, as the expression, see the forest through the trees, you know, when you're when you're in it um, in the season in particular. But it became pretty clear to me, <clears throat> you know, because it wasn't just about the outcomes of the games. It was the way the, the, the style of play, the way we were playing, the the competitive nature of the team. It just, there were a lot a lot of um, I felt like gaps in our performance that that cut against our identity, cut against, you know, our process and in our messaging. And so, um, you know, essentially kind of about midseason, right, right. Well, right when we were playing after the Kentucky game, that was when it first kind of hit me in the face. I I think the UNLV game was disappointing and so was the Wake Forest game. But I I believe that there were there were things that were going on under the surface that hadn't quite revealed themselves um, until we played against Kentucky. Um, and if you remember, that was, you know, um, offensively a performance where we uh, had two turnovers go for touchdown, another that, that set up possession, I believe, inside the 10 yard line. And and um, and then just just the nature of the finish and the, the way we were playing. So that that was alarming. It was immediately addressed. But when you're addressing those things in season and you're confronting things, you're doing it in a way to triage, you know, an identity, which again, should be set in place through the off season. And um, I guess a, a long way to answer it is just, you're constantly evaluating those things, you know, coming out of fall camp where we started off, um, you know, with a number of soft tissue issues that we never quite overcame through the course mm -hmm. of the season. Those become like little miniature train wrecks that just continue to compound as the year goes on. Uh, to the level of connectedness, I felt like particularly offensively where I, or I just sensed that um, somehow the culture was getting undermined and we, we weren't playing with identity. Um, and and all of that then when walking off the field after the t game at Tennessee, just to say, like, I don't I don't know exactly what this is going to look like, but I know that we, we're not going to stay the same. We have to change to move forward. Um, and certainly that change starts with me. You know, I think it's just a, the, the, the nature in which I evaluate our systems. Um, in some ways, Chris, I think when I look back at 22 and I think about, you know, winning two of the last three there um, and then starting off with two wins, you know, there was a point at the beginning of the season where we, we'd won four out of five games. I think progress um, and, and, and results can, can be great and feel great. I also think that they can lie to you and, and my attention needs mm -hmm. to be on what kind of is under the surface. Um, and th that, that was the impetus for the changes. You know, it, it was um, once I kind of got a grip on it, it was easy for me to recognize the things that I felt like were just out of sync with what we want to be and um, step into the changes that needed to happen to, to move us forward. Luke, I'll give you next. Well, Clark, I, I kind of want to talk about what you're doing, shifting uh, yourself to the defensive coordinator. Um, I was there under Woody Woodenhofer, and Woody and I had conversations after he did it. Or, and he felt like that it, uh, not just the uh, technical change, but he just felt like that he got closer to the players. And by that I mean, and maybe you're already experiencing that, in meetings and that type of thing to where kids that you, when you were having to oversee everything and not be so involved with the defense – that you may have missed and learning more about what, who you can count on on Saturdays? Well, I, um, first of all, it was one of those things, Luke, where obviously I, I, you know, I built my career defensively. I, you know, I, I love doing that. Um, I've got a real passion for defensive football. And um, I think anytime that you, you're able to interact around your passion, it creates genuine connection. So, so yes to, to what your experience was with Woody in terms of just, here in the first couple months, like my ability to teach and coach these guys um, at a different level. And it is different because as the head coach, you got to be careful um, to empower people to do their job. Um, I was trying to learn how to do mine. 
I knew that to make this transition, I needed to strengthen everything around me. So I needed a support staff that knew how to function a certain way that was going to kind of keep my plate uh, clean, so to speak. And I knew that I needed strength and leadership on offense. I, you know, that was something that, you know, stuck out to me in general, but I knew if I was going to take on the defense, I needed some big picture thinkers on offense and uh, both Tim back with, with 10 seasons of head coaching experience and, and um, obviously coordinating experience and Jerry kill with however long 40 years of head coaching experience, whatever it is, he's been, he's done it a long time. Those guys, <laughs> are able to to make sure that offense is running, functioning in lockstep. And I'm talking about the process and the procedures and the meetings and the install. Um, and so that that means that I can dive in and be be a little more narrow in my my approach each day with the defensive staff. I, I have I have loved that transition. I have uh, it's reinvigorated me. Um, now it's it's certainly made me more busy. So I don't have a lot of time um, throughout each day, but, um, it's again, reconnecting me with my passion, um, creating authentic and genuine connection with the, with the defensive players. Um, and, uh, it's been, it's been a ton of fun to this point. Now we haven't given up a point and we haven't given up a yard. So, um, let's, let's talk again after we've done that. And, you know, uh, but I'm just, I'm, I'm on fire to improve this program. I'm on fire to improve the on-field performance, the way we play football, and taking on this role was a way that I put a portion of that under my direct leadership and control. And I thought, um, you know, rather than try to find someone to message through, like, why not just step into that myself and and have the opportunity to connect with these guys on that level? Coach, you, you mentioned some of the soft tissue issues, and I think you've connected that back to, you know, that starting in the weight room and in the strength and conditioning program. Bringing in Robert Steiner, uh, we've heard a lot of good things about him so far. What what do you like the most, and um, and and what kind of was the impetus of of making that change and, and eventually bringing him in? Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I want to be careful not to um, pinpoint one area with responsibility in terms of the health of the team. I think that's a there's a holistic approach to that, and um, and certainly the way we train the team is a part of it, a big part of it. But, we're, you know, we want to look at our systems in terms of how we fuel the team and how we recover the team, both in our um, in our modalities in the training room, but also what are the systems we have in place in our weight room that that help bring the player back or uh, create better range of motion or flexibility or, you know, all the things, the corrective exercises that, that we've come to know here now um, each day. Um, and. I feel like we we advanced here um, in strength and conditioning for a couple of seasons, and then we kind of hit a wall. Um, and at Vanderbilt, you can't we can't expect to achieve the things that we want to achieve without winning in that specific area. So um, I knew I knew that we needed to change and transform the messaging in that room. Um, and I I had worked with um, Robert Steiner at Notre Dame, and we had become really close um, colleagues and friends and had a ton of respect for him. He's super smart. Now, when you, when you, he's also tough. I mean, he's got the cauliflower ear and the tattoos and all the, <laughs> all the grizzle you need to, to, to listen because you know, he's been through it, but he's a scientist also. And I think in that room, it's a, we are, we're in a unique era where there has to be, your culture's built in, in the weight room. I felt like if I got that higher, right, that there would actually be less need for my voice, right? Because the the program now is set off the direction and the course that I envision. Our culture, our identity, all of that is communicated clearly through the things that we put in place. But it, it needs to be operationalized or um, actualized in habits, behaviors, actions we take. And I think the weight room is a great place for that. Um, and so what I brought in with Coach Steiner was someone who was in lockstep with what we envision the program to be, what's important to us in terms of the competitive environment and the effort and work it takes to, um, to, to, to make that our reality here. And I, again, I, without going too far into the weeds, it, 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 I, my life has changed completely because mm. a year ago I was meeting with this team, even in January and February, four days a week, we would have team meetings. That was, that was for me to, to kind of pound home cultural messaging. And by the time we got halfway through the season, 
you know, I was tired of my voice. I, I, I need I need that message and that identity to be executed in smaller echo chambers. And mm-hmm. there's no better time to do that than when you're training the team and push, pushing capacity. And you, you honestly, you have them in the middle of the suffering and sacrifice that winning requires. That's when they need that message. Um, and so Steiner has been masterful that way. He does it exactly how I want him to do it, which doesn't mean he tries to be a version of me. He's unique. I mean, he, he stays true to who he is as a person, but there's just such alignment there. Um, he and I, um, we're, we're, he's actually Tuesdays and Thursdays. I, he trains me in the weight room, so I'm getting my ass kicked by him, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we are, we meet every day. We talk every day. Um, you know, we have, I, there's a lunch once a week where me and Steiner and J- Jerry sit down and just chop it up with observations and it, it, th- those, those connections and, and, and his willingness to be connected and desire to, to be in lockstep with me. Um, now I've been in there every day. I've, 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 you know, watched him train the team. I've been around the team. I've watched how they've engaged. I think one of the cool things that's come out of this, I see a more confident team. And, and, and I guess that maybe that's not a surprise that when you're training at a certain capacity level and you're breaking, having individual breakthroughs that you, you are going to walk around with a little more swagger, but you know, the guys are attacking, they're less hesitant. Um, you know, it used to be on hard days. You could just sense, you could hear a pin drop as they waited in the hallway. Now there's an energy and excitement and, I don't want to come across as saying that, you know, one thing cures all ills. You know, we, we have a, there was an overhaul that happened here um, to address a lot of the things I felt like needed to change. But certainly I think we have benefited greatly from introducing Steiner to this program and having him uh, develop that level of genuine relationship and authenticity in the weight room. Clark, it was kind of astonishing to me that you were able to pull Jerry Kill in, a sitting head coach who had just taken a team to what, I guess, two bowls and had a great reputation to, to get him to quit that, to, to come to you in this role. How did that happen? And what was the connection there? Did you have some kind of previous relationship with him or how did that go down? Because I, I didn't really expect the great um, – influx of New Mexico state people. That wasn't a thing I had on my radar going into the off season. Well, I, um, I, 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 this all started, well, I've, I've met, um, Jerry before, not, not spent a ton of time with him, but, um, competed against him when he was at Minnesota and I was at Syracuse. Um, and I've always just had a great respect for him as we all have. I mean, he's, he's just got such a reputation as a program builder and, you know, he he has a unique way of going about it, too, which, you know, I think for me, I in my coaching career, I've always looked to, to learn from people who have a formula that they execute and it works. Um, but, I, you know, it, this was a, a really hard year um, for me, I think, you know, and again, I, I share that and I know we're we're speaking to Vandy fans right now. I mean, yeah, you know, this is. Uh, this is home. This is my place. This is, you know, I came here to, to win and I want, I want to win yesterday. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's like, um, I'm impatient for growth. And I felt like um, there was so much about progress that made sense to me from year two to year three, retaining systems and retaining people and retaining players. And what I learned through the season was, um, again, that, that we have to, we have to change it's change the people or change the people. And it means we're either transforming the way they approach the work and the way they approach uh, the process, or we need to move on from them so that we can interject the new energy and the new mindset, the new attitude towards what we're doing. Um, so as I'm going through all this last season towards the end of the year, New Mexico state goes down to Auburn and just throttles mm-hmm. Auburn. And I, you know, when I, when I saw the score, I was like, God, you know, that that's it. You know, that's what we want to be. Hmm. And so I started to study that game um, and all, all three phases. I would just watch it from snap one to the finish. And I probably watched it maybe 10 times, honestly. I mean, it wow. was, this is before I'd made any definitive decision about course changes. 
And what stood out to me watching the game, first of all, it wasn't like they, you know, Auburn beat themselves, right? It wasn't like they, you know, they just had a bad day. I mean, this this was a New Mexico State team that was not the better team on the field. I should say the bet, more talented team was the better team in the way they executed, the belief they played with, and how hard they played. Um, their systems were sound, solid, and simple. It wasn't overly complex. It wasn't gimmicky. But they had answers, and you could tell they were they well coached and organized. And um, I, I've shown our defense uh, the first snap of the game from from um, that game, and to show them the level of communication and connectedness on the field. I mean, they Auburn's motioning on the first play of the game, and it's like New Mexico State motions before them. It is just such a um, they're they're so well prepared, and um, and so. I was I was looking at that and and at the time thinking you know we need to I'm going to take the staff to Las Cruces to spend time mm. to, and to just connect with these guys and to really dig in on what they've done. Well, and then you know as as kind of the season moved on for us, I just realized that there was going to need to be some staffing changes um, because I'm not interested in in doing anything other than what I believe is the best for winning performance at Vanderbilt. I mean, that's why I'm here. So, um, so I went back to that film just to, just to look at it again. And I, I just was fascinated with, um, Tim Beck and I, and I had, I had a, a set of like, um, like, you know, qualitative metrics that I was working off of when I made the decision on the offensive coordinator position where I felt like this is what success would look like at Vanderbilt. And, um, and so as I kind of, there were a few candidates that I was working through, but as I put Tim's performance through that, through those numbers, he, he, he was really well regarded in all those analytical aspects. So it made sense for me to call and, and, and visit with him. I love the fact that he had head coaching experience. I love the fact that he'd worked himself up from division two football Um, you know, it's just like when you're problem solving at that level, you just figure things out and, um, and, and you're not always going to line up and be better than you have to find ways to win. Um, and, and I felt like too, you know, sometimes when you see an upset like that and you, and you watch the game, you, you see like, uh, oh shoot, you know, they got a, they got a, a top 10 quarterback or they've got a, there was, there was no singular aspect of that team that stood out as like wow this is Mm. you know this is really elite what what i saw was a system and a belief and um so anyways so when i called tim to see if he'd be interested in in interviewing for our offensive coordinator job um it was the first indicator i got that that jerry may be considering Mm. um retiring and you know um and so when we went out there and, and met together and I came away really impressed with Tim, I had a chance to spend some time with Jerry and he wanted to get through his season out of respect for his team and, and wanted to give them everything he had. But I knew he was interested in the possibility of, of being a part of this. He's got a granddaughter that's, that's two hours away. Um, oh. that, uh, was a huge motivator and, I'd like to think I'm a decent enough recruiter, you know, that, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but listen, our, our mission is his mission. I mean, he, this is what he longs to do is, is come to a place like Vanderbilt that has all these great foundational aspects, but, but we're not, we're not set up all the way yet. And, and his eye and the way he scrutinizes the environment and the things that the resources and things that we need to tighten down. I mean, he's got a great ability to have an impact here with uh with a young head coach that um that's desperate just to find that level of sustained success and so i think as he and i got to know each other and got connected and um i realized where he was in his career and and that i had the opportunity to to um you know to possibly bring someone on board that that has such great perspective it it made all the sense in the world for me to push on it and um fortunately we were able to get him over the finish line and now we're having fun, uh, working on this thing together. Luke. Luke? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Clark, one other thing I want to ask you about the defensive side of the ball with you now being in charge of me and the coordinator schematically, will it be different or would it just be, 
basically, you know, will we still run a three man front a lot of times or how will it, how will it be? Yeah, no, we'll be different. I mean, it, not, not, not dramatically. I think there's going to be a little bit more connection to what we were in our first year in 21 in terms of, you know, that year Jesse came in and he and I sat and, and, you know, hired Jesse based on alignment with respect to what our system was at Notre Dame, some things that he was bringing in from Baltimore. Um, and we, you know, I think it's important that you, that you have the ability to go from a four man to a three man front anymore in college football. I think you can just solve problems um, with that level of versatility. Mm -hmm. I felt like after that first year, you know, we, we, we started to kind of uh, morph into something that that became a little less or maybe a little more predictable just in the way we were lining up and the coverages we were playing. And and I felt I felt like we we incorporated few, fewer solutions with respect to, um, you know, our scheme and, and any more. If I mean, if you line up in split safety and play split safety for an entire game, you're you're asking to to have the middle of the field. Um, in the space on the outside picked apart. And um, to, to be honest, it just wasn't good enough, you know? And I, it, so what we're, what we're working on right now is evolving this system, you know, kind of reclaiming some of the, the versatility that we had in year one, evolving the si system to contest the spaces on the field, um, making sure that we don't um, allow offenses to get us into one call against specific formations to where they can, scheme us and pick us apart and ultimately the the goal is to force an offense to go the long hard way you know we, we, we we're you know, there's no perfect call until you can line up and man you know all the skill across the board and feel like you can win you, you've got to spread the heart down around the field but um i believe that you know the the, the stops the opportunity to stop for stops are there, you know, if it's second and nine, it needs to be third and nine and let's get our subgroup on the field and let's pressure the quarterback and, and, uh, and get off the field. It's maximizing those opportunities. Um, it's forcing field goals in the red zone. Um, there's just so much room for us to, to play better defensively, but it, it absolutely starts with our system, our structure, the principles within that structure and how we best put those together for our players to be successful. Sure. Offensively, coach, obviously the quarterback room is looking a little bit different all of a sudden with, you know, some some youth coming in, you know, a few transfers. Uh, Dickey, of course, still in the room. Uh, big quarterback room. What what I guess where do you where do you go in terms of, you know, because there are a lot of questions from fans about, you know, who's the guy, yada, yada. I'm sure we you get those all the time. But what do you look at now? I know spring ball hasn't even started yet, but. Um, wh where is the, the thought process there of maybe bringing in a different style of quarterback and, and where you go from here and, and implementing what Tim Beck wants to do offensively in that room? Well, it, it, you guys are going to get tired of me because this is going to start the course of what, like a five month, you know, <laughs> uh, it's a competition, you know, I mean, I, uh, we, we are going to allow the competition to go as long as it needs to go. Um, now we we've been very intentional of, with how we've reshaped that room um, and we felt like the kids that we had coming in are athletic enough to be able to run the ball so i'm talking about our our signees um that they're skilled throwers um they they, they were they were kind of uh, versatile players um we've added some guys that can we feel like can can move the the chains running the ball can be dual threat we're going to have to run the quarterback. Um, you know, I think when you look at the success we had in, in two, um, one thing that you recognize is, um, I think, you know, obviously Ray Davis was a really good player. Um, Mike Wright being back at quarterback for, for a uh, significant portion of that season, including the two SEC wins, um, I believe forced the defense to, to defend all 11 positions. And I think that helps us open up a run game. Um, you know, we're not going to win just by going out and trying to score more points. We have to, we have to limit possessions by the opponent through controlling the game offensively, which means we need to be able to establish a run game. And if we can't do that, um, obviously I think you put this advantage. Um, and that doesn't mean that, you know, we're going to line up and we're just going to play smash mouth football. I think we got to be creative with how we establish that run game and then find ways to be explosive off that to set up um, a dynamic passing attack. But 
Um, running the ball at the quarterback position is important for us. Um, and, um, and then the ability on pass downs to escape the pocket at times and to, and to create, if it's two, two conversions a game, where on third down we're able to evade a rush and, and make um, a defense pay. So what, what was happening to us a year ago is, you know, teams are playing two man, which is a really hard coverage to, to, um, you know, to, to pick apart, uh, particularly when you're not getting open on the perimeter and, <clears throat> and they're not having to spy the quarterback. So you, you can <clears throat> add a rush to that uh, to shorten the down. Yeah, I think at least now when we put the guy back there, there's going to be a need to pay attention to him on all downs. And if teams aren't willing to do that, again, we have the ability now to, to puncture the ball running it. Um, th- those are great advantages. And so as far as the quarterback room goes, you know, we, we've, we've built it around that mindset, that philosophy. That is about learning for us from the last few years to say, what, what does this look like and what does it look like when we've been most successful? Um, and so that, that's kind of been the, the thought process. Uh, and, um, obviously I'm excited to, you know, to see it play out. I, you know, we have to pick and choose the times in the spring where we're going to, you know, potentially allow that position to be hit. You know, I think it's, it's, it's one thing to say, we're going to run the quarterback and another thing to put them in a red Jersey and, mm-hmm. and ever allow them to, you know, to, to show us what they can do in space. And so that's, those are conversations for us to have over the next couple of weeks, but, uh, that's been the general uh, thought process is we know we need to be able to run there to extend to extend drives, um, to establish another way to, to run the football, to force our opponent to defend all 11 positions. That does not mean that we're going to be a triple option team at all. If you look at what New Mexico State did, they found creative ways. And this is really what Jerry and Tim have done their whole career. They find creative ways to run that position that aren't all just zone read plays. Um, that allow you to get hats and, and create advantages for, for an offense where, where sometimes you're not winning all the matchups uh, against the opponent. Clark, we've got a hard out in about two minutes here. So I'm, I'm going to give you a question that, that may be more impossible to answer in two minutes than anything you'll do all year. Uh, you NIL. Know, we have a two minute answer in my. In my, in my <laughs> well, we're, we're going we're gonna to try you out here. Best shot. Um, NIL, a lot of stuff in there about you guys and your developments. Um, maybe the second part will be separating any fact from fiction. But the, the, the way I understand it, it's not so much about the amount that's there, but the people that you can go to with particular last if you need this or that. Is is that a fair way to put where you guys are? And just any any thoughts that you have on the, on the state of where you are with your your war chest with that? Yeah, so um, I want to I want to be as succinct as I can with this. The first thing is that anyone who cares about Vanderbilt football is paying attention to the NIL. You know, we we didn't have uh, much of anything in place a, a year ago, and really we leaned on a couple of people that we've leaned on for decades here to help um, bridge the gap. NIL actually presents us an opportunity because you know, we've never involved ourselves in the the payment of players. And obviously this all runs through the collective, but, you know, this has been normalized and legalized in college football. So what a great chance for Vanderbilt to not have to, um, you know, um, exclude ourselves from a game that's been being, that's been played as we all know for a long time. I, I think like um, we miss sometimes on the opportunity because we, we take an approach and a mindset that says, you know, because we haven't done this, we're not set up to do it. Um, the truth is, uh, we all become a lot better recruiters when all of a sudden we're not asking someone just to make a decision out of the goodness of their heart. All the transformational pieces, all the substantive pieces are here. Um, the relationship pieces, we do really well with um, kids and families on our campus. Our ability to retain this recruiting class, um, though we went through tor- turmoil both as a staff and in the season, had nothing to do with NIL, nothing. It has to do with the sense of connection that was built in the recruiting process and and specifically my involvement in that process with with uh, these prospects and their families because in the end, when the, when the assistant coach leaves or the coordinator leaves, there has to be something that maintains connection. So that said, um, you know, Candace and I have had really, um, really direct conversations about what what this needs to look like. And, and she has not flinched at all with respect mm-hmm. to 
um, making sure that we we are moving this in the direction that allows us to be competitive. Um, and so I can't give her enough credit for her willingness to step in and step up and to reimagine this. Um, and so to answer your question, yes, um, I think anytime the athletic director is on board and involved and understands, um, but you don't have a program or a team if you don't have NIL and the more NIL you have, the better team you will have. That is the reality of the world we live in now. Um, and I don't care how good of a coach you are. You know, you can only coach a team um, to a certain point of progress. You know, you need to make sure you're retaining the players you're developing and that you're going out in the portal and you're able to add pieces that they can help move the product forward. Um, you know, we are under construction here. We are we are somewhere in flux with respect to the quality of our facilities and the vision for the future. Um, you know, again, I go back to anyone that cares about Vanderbilt football needs to care about NIL because this is an opportunity for us to step in and have something that that um, ultimately uh, means that someone can come here and not have any compromises. Hey, Clark, thanks so much. I'm sorry we didn't have a little more time today. You can blame Billy for that. But say, I mean, you know, Billy's holding we, we blame Billy for everything around here. But uh, <laughs> hey. th thank you so much for joining us. Um, for Luke and Billy, I'm Chris Lee. Um, Clark Lee, of course, Vanderbilt football coach, has been our guest. We appreciate you watching and listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast. All right, we're good.